Um, so, this is going deeper with Python Theano. Um, if you're expecting my machine learning talk, where I will talk about Keynes and Hadoop, this is not the right talk. Um, this is all about deep learning, which is hot stuff in kind of Google Labs, but it doesn't require huge clusters of machines necessarily. Um, about me, so I um, did some kind of finance stuff, some uh, startup stuff, some machine learning stuff. I came to Singapore about almost two years ago. Last year, I was just having fun um, doing machine learning. Um, I came here as a Pythonist, um, but I had a kind of little affair with Go, Scala, Node, Haskell along the way. But I've come back to Python because of the kind of the ecosystem and this Theano thing I'm going to talk about. Um, this year, I'm doing um, serious NLP and actually getting paid for fun. So that's good, good by me. So quick outline. I'm going to talk a bit about what people are doing with this, um, why Python, Theano, and whatever is a good choice. And there's going to be some demos and code. But it's all a bit a mismatch because some things you need to know up front. Other things are kind of interesting as we go along. Um, hopefully, you can follow me. So deep learning, basically, these are neural networks in multiple layers fed with tons of data. Um, a bit of history, back in the 80s, um, everyone thought neural networks were going to solve everything. But by the mid-90s, um, people had enormous problems solving the XOR problem, which is like the, the simplest problem. And basically, it went through a long winter um, until about 2005. Um, there are a few people who carried on the faith, um, but basically it, it turned into a bit of a wasteland. But in 2005, suddenly they discovered they could train deeper networks, um, and, and it really worked, which is a surprise to everyone. And then 2010, people started to put these on GPUs, which means that you can now look at serious quantities of data in realistic times. So, um, so the people who are involved, basically, there's a group of people, Hinton and Lecun and Bengio. These are the stalwarts who continued through the AI winter. Um, they kept, you know, kept at it. But now they've all moved to the big names. Um, apart from his, well, his son is, I think, um, a, a one of the big names too. But um, basically, there, there are some centers who are doing you know, this, this work at scale and publishing all about it. Um, so the basic approach here is, is really the same as neural networks always used to be. So this field has been around for 30 years or more. So basically you take some very simple mathematical units, um, you combine them, at, in, in your, how much you're going to combine them to compute complex functions. And we're gonna, this is really about supervised learning. Um, there are other clever things you can do. So here we are. This is a diagram of a simple neuron. If you've seen anything like this, this is a very familiar diagram. Basically, at the bottom, you have an input. Um, then you have a series of weights. And essentially, to, connect, to, com uh, to calculate the thing in the middle, you do a dot product. Um, you may add a, add a bias term. And then you apply some kind of nonlinearity function. So that gives you one output. So here we have a vector going in, some weights, to a single output. And basically, by changing the weights, you can change the function which the output is, is producing. And what you then do is say, OK, what I want to, want to do is I have several outputs and more inputs, but also by having some hidden layers in the middle to compute kind of intermediate representations, this becomes a more powerful function you can compute. Um, and the trick is, how do you train everything? Because these hidden, if I look at this hidden one layer, it's connected to the inputs, but only indirectly to the outputs. Um, so the basic scheme for supervised learning is, while until you're ready, which is a kind of a, a how long is a piece of string, you pick a training case, which will be some x, and I have a target y that I want to learn. And what I do is I t take my network and I say, well, what is my network telling me for my output? And then I want to twiddle all of the weights until my output is close to the target. And the trick is, how do you twiddle these things? Basically, you try and do some kind of gradient descent. 
um, you can calculate just the sum of all the errors and this gives you something you can now optimize over um, and this is one very big optimization problem because these networks can be enormous um, and I'll explain how enormous they can get but um, basically you can use the chain rule of differentiation to find what the the delta of any given weight is in the network for the inputs and outputs so you can actually feed back um, all, all the activation changes so here's a here's the kind of the simplest serious problem that people had called MNIST and it's now kind of the hello world problem in that if you've got a network or a neural network system you have got to be able to do this now it used to be a serious people the serious uh, challenge that people worked on, um, but now basically it's kind of end of life as a useful benchmark because um, for any any r realistic network, the errors that you get are bad images. Now th these images, pretty small, um, these are kind of 28 by 28 pixel images of handwritten digits, and so you, basically your input is a 28 by 28 matrix um, of zeros and ones. And your output is something from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Um, and so here's, here's, the sim here's the simple way to do it. Um, you have your inputs here on, so on the left side. So this is a rotated diagram. Um, so there's 28 by 28 is a 784 array of inputs. Um, you have, s suppose you have 100 hidden units and you have 10 potential outputs from 1 to 9. Uh, so basically you can see that this is going to turn into quite a lot of connections to learn because this input of 700 each one of these is connected to every one of the hidden units so we've now got um, quite a lot 78k um, weights to learn there so so th this is but you know this is only say up to a hundred thousand um, things to learn Okay, so having, let's just suppose that we can solve this thing and, and basically any, any, anything will be able to solve that problem now. Now people are interested in newer, bigger problems and this is where Google starts to get interested because they have huge, huge databases of images, some of which have captions. People are labeling um, just their photos as they come in. What people are interested in is being able to learn all photos or being able to understand what's in a picture um, and so they've formed a competitions whereby these pictures are of kind of foods um, and the challenge is is this a hamburger or a, is this a burger or a hot dog or I mean, but there are 22,000 so this is a, an overall very much more complicated problem uh, with 15 million images this is multi-gigabyte data set, um, and well, this is where you say, well, let's go for something a bit faster than my CPU. So, the top line, we have a, a decent um, Intel Core processor. Um, the, key, the key things here is the memory bandwidth, which is great, but compare this to the GPU, the GPU is beating it hands down, um, floating point maths, these GPUs, even my laptop has a GPU um, coprocessor in it. This is a thousand sing dollar laptop. Um, and you can do serious computer, computation on this. Uh, five trillion flops, not, not this laptop, but five, this is a modern graphics card. Um, five trillion flops is quite a lot of flops. Um, so Python, so where does it come in? Um, Python is great for high-level glue code. Lots of researchers love it because it has all this ecosystem. And kind of the enabling things here are IPython, which is a, is a beautiful system. And I'm going to show you a bit of some bokeh, which is a, a visualization element for that. Um, there's Theano, which is, this is stuff which is coming out of research groups. I'll talk about Theano with blocks and all. Um, and tons of people love love Python so uh, okay so Theano is kind of the meat of where this is going um, and this produces optimized numerical computations in Python so wh where is this different from say a numpy computation 
In NumPy, you describe what your variables are and exactly how they're combined. And line by line, it produces the answer for you. Theano is different in that you describe the problem, it then analyzes the problem and spits out code itself. And then internally, it will then run the code, and it, this is going to be optimized code. And the code it produces, because it, can, it knows about the full scope of the tree of computation it's going to do, it can do some neat optimizations. And well, if, if you have, well, and you require NumPy, if you have BLAST installed, which is a, um, a matrix operation, like it will use that. It can spit out C and C++. It spits out CUDA and OpenCL. Parenthetically, um, this is cool stuff because it, it, it analyzes the full extent of your problem and produces code, which is basically the GPU thing. You don't want to be writing CUDA for all of this stuff, um, and you'll see why. So, here's a quick a quick demo, which is is more to do with the um, just just showing you. I'm sure everyone has seen IPython here. Um, can can people read that? Not much. Can we? Can I go bigger? Can I let me go a bit bigger? Come on. Excuse me. This is not going to let me zoom. Okay. Is this okay? Okay. So basically, okay, this, and, and, and I should also say that the, um, I've got a, a Git repo which has got all of this stuff in. So this is on, this is on GitHub. Um, it includes the presentation. Um, there's, there's these IPython notebooks. There are models. Um, there's a README which has instructions, um, and th th there's a lot, to be f lo lot of fun to be had in this uh, repo. So. so here we have um, a notebook concerning Theano, Bokeh, and in the IPython notebook. Um, it has some instructions about how you would set up a, you start a Bokeh server. So the, the neat thing about Bokeh is it's a plotting library, but it, it can operate interactively. So instead of just plotting a graph which is static, you can plot a graph which you can then manipulate, which is kind of useful because these experiments take a long time, and you may want to just sit there letting it accumulate results and see how it's going. Um, so this is how this explains how you would actually use this thing. If I uh, run all above, da -da -da, and run this one. <coughs> It's going to do it. Come on. Okay, so he here we have Bokeh successfully loaded. Um, this thing is, is loading up some random vectors and plotting them. So but Bokeh has some kind of nice, nice visualization thing. I'm sorry, it's, it's, it's out of proportion. Um, and, and, and it allows you to, to, to manipulate this stuff. Um, it's kind of cool. So here's just to, to show that this can optimize and how Theano looks. This is a very simple test case to fit x to the a, where a is some parameter, to x squared. And obviously a should be 2 at the end of this. Basically with this you, you say, okay, I want some, a Theano variable. a is a Theano variable. But not only is Python variable A, this thing, but I'll call it A for Theano, because Theano is looking at a graph which it's building up. It doesn't actually care about the Theano names. So it doesn't care about the Python names of these variables. It cares about the various entities which it's now going to manipulate. So A is going to depend, the training and test data is going to depend on X, which is a piece of data. It then <coughs> calculates how off I am, which is going to be the absolute value of x squared minus x to the a, um, and then I'm just going to try and optimize it so that the cost is as low as possible. So this will run. Okay, so Theano has now built a graph. 
Um, this thing is a thing called fuel, which is part of this um, blocks and fuel thing. Um, basically, it produce, this is going to produce a, a stream of random numbers. So this is v the, the whole fuel thing is designed because um, neural network people want to load data sets, look at training data, look at test data. Um, they have holdouts. They have a, a variety of things you want to do to manipulate this data, and it makes sense to abstract it. So all, all of this is as abstracted as possible. So this creates kind of a, a stream. I can, I can have a look at what the stream produces. And then here is kind of uh, the blocks stuff to actually create a loop. So this describes in blocks terms what a loop of these, this algorithm is. And basically, this is going to give me, off this data stream, I'll do gradient descent using this cost, varying A with a step rule. And then there are various extensions, and one of which will be plotting this out. So if I now just run this, you can see that here's my A, and here's my error. You can see that A is tending to 2, just as it should. So, and this comes up in real time, so this is kind of nice. Um, and this is used in the, my notebook is running both the IPython thing and then another process is running a bokeh server. In the background, Theano and Blocks is sending data to the bokeh server, which is pushing it into my browser. Um, so that's kind of nice. Um, end of that demo. So I said things were going to get more complicated. Um, so this is, this is a 2014 Google Lynette, which is one of the more, is, is now getting more current for doing this kind of image net uh, competition. This is kind of the network that people are using, whereas each of the boxes is a whole essentially matrix operation or a functional operation over its input. Um, stuff is coming in on the left going out on the right and producing results. And so this is the kind of results that you can get. Um, so you can see that the, the second thing is the container ship, which it's getting right, or motor scooter, or leopard. These are pretty, it's not so obvious on the, the, the lower ones. Is there's a, it actually wants the word grill there, is the label that people had, whereas this thinks it's a convertible. Um, the mushroom, or the, the one with the dog, it, the label that is required is cherry, which it seems pretty tough. Um, so th you can see that this, this is kind of a, a tough data set. And basically, the, the, the set I showed before is a guy at Stanford who actually went through and tried to manually guess what the label should be. And it was getting something like a 5% error rate. So these, these, these networks are now better than humans. Um, in you know in certain ways, um, partly because they're very good at telling breeds of dog apart. I mean that they may not be get so good at uh, just general like child or pizza, but they're very good at, at you know distinguishing finer things than most humans know how to do. So let me just describe what Blocks does. Um, it's an overlay on top of Theano. Uh, it's developed by the Montreal Group, who also developed Theano in the first place. It was announced a few weeks ago, so this is this has caused some um, sleepless nights. So it's actively development. They have documented it ahead of releasing it to some extent. Um, they accept, I know, accept pull requests, um, and there's been some furious GitHub activity. Um, and they're very helpful guys um, and girls. So. Here's a kind of teaser for the neural networks people in the crowd. I've previously talked about an, another framework called Lasagna, um, but to my mind, Block seems even higher level, and they're also interested in even newer stuff. So uh, I'll, I'll describe that in a little bit. So basically, it's a domain-specific language to describe these deep networks. Um, it understands all about initialization of the weights, um, the various sigmoid functions you might use, how gradient descent should proceed, what crossed functions to use. There's add-ons like beam search, 
all of this stuff is, is kind of the toolkit of people doing research um, and not having to re-implement all this from scratch is a huge, a huge, huge time saver. And you also know that it's implemented properly because, you know, this is a, a serious project. Um, so what's next, I guess? How can you possibly do more than um, 22,000 different labels on these images? Well, if you look on the left side, basically what we're doing is a kind of a one-to-one -one, um, mapping. We take an image and produce a label. But there's a lot more you can do. So the one-to-many is basically if you put in an image, um, what, what could you, many could you produce? What I'd like to produce is a textual caption. So I'd like to say, this is a man holding a pizza, and that sentence could be as long as the network wants to make it. Or this could be, there's, you know, the caption is arbitrary English or arbitrary language. This many to one, I could put in a sentence, um, like a movie review, and I should, I'm looking for the sentiment to get out. So this is a thing where I want to analyze an arbitrary amount of text and consolidate it into one arm. Equally, you can have many to many. So many to many could be I want to put in English and get out Chinese. So the, the, that seems like a tough thing. The many to many is the more difficult. This, people use this for, say, um, audio transcription. So you're putting in a bunch of audio which you know, is irregular in terms of timing, and out of it you actually want the word stream. So the words don't actually match the... Um, each word by itself, it has to be mapped to the audio stream. So this may seem esoteric, but I mean, every Android phone since Jelly Bean has had one of these things in because that's what it's using to recognize your voice. Um, this is, you know, the, the interesting thing of this, though, is that because you've got tons of data, and Google has tons of data, Baidu has tons and tons of data, um, basically you can put in some examples of training cases and by gradient descent and by backpropagating error terms, you can train these things from zero. Um, so let's have a look at quick look at how image labeling works. Basically, you take your image and you feed it into the same network that you produced the 22,000 labels off before. But instead of just the one label, you say, okay, well, you, you snip it off about you know, 90% of the way through. You say, well, what is your internal representation of the elements in this, which will be, instead of having the one label of being leopard, there'll be a certain amount of spottiness, there'll be, ha is there a cat, are there trees? There'll be kind of um, things to do with leopardness at levels ben beneath the output stage. So you feed this into what's called an, an LSTM network, and this is, a this is a network which is more like a, um, a cellular autonom automata in that it has an internal state, which it then maps to itself again and again and again. And you give it, at the bottom, you're giving it like a, a symbol which says go, like start, and out of the top it pops, you know, this, then you feed back the word this, and it feeds forward its internal state, and you say, is a leopard in a tree? Stop. And so th this network will, you train it on the phrase, and it will actually learn to produce phrases in English from zero understanding. You, ha you haven't actually told it anything about grammar or what a leopard is, other than this phrase has been associated with, or not, not this specific phrase, just things, if there's a leopard and there's a tree, the way you explain it is by producing this series of words, or, and, it will and it will do that. So, and here's the internals of an LSTM unit. Basically, you have um, an input at the bottom, and you have in the middle where there's a C, there's a kind of a cumulative state, and you have all sorts of funky remember this, forget this switches, and th it is remarkable that this thing can do anything at all. Um, but the reality is you can backpropagate all the error terms through this because you can differentiate it. And because you can then stack them one after the other, differentiate through the whole thing. Um, but this is where you stop wanting to write your differentiation code in NumPy. You need a machine to produce this network. 
So here's, a, here's an example of some image labels that can be done with this. Um, in the, it's going to be kind of tough to read. In the top right, we've got a person riding a motorcycle on a dirt road. So this is produced you know, completely abstractly. This is what the computer feels is in the picture, word after the next. Or at the bottom, there's a herd of elephants walking across a dry grass field. Then as in the next column, we've got um, two dogs. This is kind of less good. So two dogs play in the grass, which arguably there are more than two dogs. Or at the bottom, a, a close-up of a cat lying on a couch. Now, this is wrong because it's lying on a bed, or it's sitting on a bed. And over on the left-hand side, the right-hand side, you've got first one, a dog jumping to catch a frisbee, which is not right. The second one down is a refrigerator filled with lots of food and drinks. So it's plainly got this, the wrong end of the stick about these images. Um, so there's some way to go. But this is kind of, this is, um, it is amazing that the network, without any knowledge, apart from seeing tons of captions, tons of images, can now respond to different images with something interesting. So let me show you something which is, is not at that level, because this, the image processing level requires a huge amount of training data and a huge amount of GPU training time. Um, I'll show you something rather simpler, um, which I, I call um, recursive neural network as author. Basically, what, I, what I'm doing here is I'm taking something even simpler than an LSTM unit, and obviously this requires a lot of blocks, imports, where these are the different kinds of things, which elements you're going to incorporate in this. Um, I define a dictionary, which is going to be the dictionary of characters in what I'm going to feed it is a bunch of text. And I'm going to feed it Shakespeare's poetry. Um, so all it was going to receive is character by character all the poems of Shakespeare. Now there's another one which you can switch on to being the plays of Shakespeare. Um, so taking that stuff, basically if I run, run it to, to here, I'm going to run this. So basically, this, this is the start of the file. So this, all it's receiving is you know, a couple of spaces, a tab, then capital A, space, capital L. So the, the sequence of symbols here is, is just characters. So then we go on to saying, well, let's define a model. So I'm going to use a gated recurrent unit. I'm going to generate a sequence of outputs um, with, a, with a, an emitter, which what it's going to do is it's going to emit, emit characters. So basically, if it emits, a, if it's looking at the word the, it will see a capital T, it will try and produce an H. Now in the beginning, it won't produce an H, it'll be another random character. And I'll just say, you know, it should be more like an H because I'm looking at the word the. Okay. Once it has, but once it produces this random character, it will then feed that character back at the bottom and produce another character. And gradually, I will actually be saying, you should be looking at this sentence um, to produce, and it will fiddle all of the weights so that it gets more and more accurate to communicate English, which it's not going to get to, I'm afraid. But. So, da da da. We have a bit about logger. So we're going to do a gradient descent thing just before. Uh, here's a training loop. This is as before. And so I can now just run this thing. Now this is it's going to take a little while. So this I'm just doing one epoch. So one epoch here is reading the collected poems of Shakespeare. <coughs> Um, once. Now, that, that's the only experience of the English language this machine has ever had, um, and, and you'll see why. You'll see it's not very good. So, so here, here I just run the same model, but through a different graph, just saying, give me your output, feed that back yourself, tell me what you have, and it produces this. So this is not a very strong understanding of English poetry. 
Um, but what we can do is we can just go up here again and just leave this running. There we go. So sorry, da -da -da. right. So, so off it goes doing. It's already done one epoch. It's done two epochs. It's done three epochs. So this, this little machine is, is doing its thing. Um, so I, I've I've produced some from before. Um, we can check back with this. So this is what you get if you train it for one epoch. This is actually it was doing better on our screen. This is basically you know it's like a Perl programmer. Um, this is Epoch 100. It's started to get the hang of spaces and something to do with frequencies. Epoch 1000. Now it's beginning to do something which scans. It's all a bit of an... It's still nonsense. But here's, here's where you say, I, I may have reached the limits of this very simple unit because it doesn't actually have much internal state. It can, I think it can remember 16 different things at once. It's, it's, the, the hidden state is very small. Um, so I think it's doing something interesting. Okay. So here's a, I trained a slightly larger network um, over the day yesterday. Um, I fed it the collected plays of Shakespeare, which is a larger data set, um, and trained it. So it's the only knowledge it has of the English language is to read the collected plays of Shakespeare 300 odd times. Um, it's begun to, it's understood that it should introduce the characters before they speak. Um, they should say stuff, which is in kind of iambic pentameter. Um, it has stage directions. It's got, it's got some notion of what's going on, but obviously not a very strong notion. There was a part of it was inspired by uh, the guy Carpathy, who produced a very nice um, one page explanation of LSTM networks and trained um, these things to, to read text on a character by character basis. Um, and you, you can play with his thing, you can play with this. This is a Theano version. He was using some other um, toolkits. So. Um, so just just to have a look at what Theano is doing for us in a, a bit of just tiny detail, um, this is part of the graph that Theano has produced to do this recurrent network to learn the poems. Um, each each of these are very small operations, but Theano will um, gather them together and convert, collect them together in a way which matches the computations it knows it can do efficiently. So this is a very small part. We can zoom out. So this is, there are quite a few of these small parts. I can zoom out again. This is now getting to like a higher level view. But the, the overall work that it's training looks like that in terms of computation. Um, and it's training that for every character um, for the works of Shakespeare you know, 300 times, whatever. And this takes a while. But this is kind of, Theano will do this for you and, and get the results right. So just as a wrap up, so Theano makes uh, GPUs Python friendly. This is cool. Um, the code is all on GitHub. I'm MDDA. Um, it's got, as I said, it's got the, the Python notebooks. There's probably more in, there's definitely more in there than I showed you. They've got installation hints, stuff. Um, if you have a look, please star it. That would be great. Um, and I'm happy to take questions. Oh, and I'm hiring. And I have a, as I said, I, this year is a serious year. I'm being paid. Um, there is a, doing to do some of this stuff in a natural language processing uh, uh, situation for a real company in Singapore um, looking to hire people. So um, not a lot of people, just we have a project. This is super interesting. Questions? I've got a, a question. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm new to so, okay. um, why have you chosen to do this data instead of with R? Okay. Um, to, to my mind and, and um, R is more of a st statistician's toolkit. They have a lot of the functions to do like single layers and maybe to implement complete networks. But if you want a toolkit which can kind of abstractly understand um, like th this computation graph and then do differentiation through all of these functions, you need higher level language than R. 
So R is very good because it will operate on like arrays and variables and concretely operate on them. Um, whereas Python, you can operate on things that operate on arrays and stuff. So I can say, please, please think, please conjure up how to do this computation. So this is where R, R is a great language for getting on the, on the surface. That lab would be great at that level. But to actually manipulate the problem as opposed to just manipulating the numbers, you need, you need more machinery than that. So with your example that you had, which was the Shakespeare text, yeah. uh, I think I must have missed the, 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 the crucial part that you mentioned. So what state was the real data that you put into? Characters. Just characters? Yes. But I did something very similar, but I did something in R. Uh, and I got a, a similar output. The, the process that I learned for a statistical model right. and a different approach. Um, so I need to look at your logic sure, and sure. understand how you approach it as opposed to how R is approached. Right, right. So a, a typical other approach would be just to have kind of a Markov chain kind of model. And that's you know, a, a fairly simple matrix-based approach. Um, and something which is definitely meant, you know, R can do this. And in fact, if you had an implementation of one of these things, you could, I guess, put it into an R module and then use it as an R function. Um, but if you want to play around with how does an LSTM work and how can I arrange these in, in stacks, and this is where you want a thing which can build stuff rather than use stuff. So. so. So, and to, to explain that, an, another popular tool set is called Torch, um, which is built using Lua as a glue language, and then people write lots of cooler code underneath that. Um, but I'm, you know, I've, I've had enough of languages th these days. I'm not going to get into Lua and CUDA. In particular, I think we, people should be doing it in OpenCL. Um, but that's a tough road. To th that's a tough road. AMD isn't making it easier. Uh, Nvidia makes it very easy for researchers because they also help them have cards um, to play with. Um, so the, the CUDA thing is pretty deeply embedded, but I, this is why I like the abstraction that Theano gives, because I just touch the CUDA code, and Theano accepts OpenCL contributions. So that's, that's another aspect. Any other questions? Thank you, Martin. Okay, just hold on. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so this is sorry. So this, and, and this is just showing after a hundred. So, so as we've been sitting here, this is now learnt a bit more about poems. The end.